It's always a good night to get in the Word of God. Amen. 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 Woo, good. Hey, uh, if we haven't met before, my name's Mike. I'm one of the pastors here at Encounter Church. It's great to be here. Hi to online church, always excellent to have you with us. Want to encourage you to reach out, have a chat with your online hosts, get to know them because the point of doing this is not just to watch from a distance but to be in community. And we know there's so many reasons why people do online church and so we want to encourage you to be interactive with that. One of the people doing online church today is my wife, Pastor Jen, not too well at the moment. So she has given me the gift of preaching this evening, which is a blessing and let's hope that's all she's given me. Amen and amen. All right. I uh, always ask the question at a time like this. Well, first I say, God, help me. And then I say, all right, you, you tell me where you need me to go, Lord. Tell me where you need me to go. And uh, I like to go to the places I feel comfortable in, the places that get me fired up to be a follower of Jesus, which means for me, I go to Acts chapter 2. Are you with me? Pentecost. Can you travel with me to Pentecost today, church? Let's get some fire in this building. Come on. Teaching text today is Acts chapter 2, verses 1 to 12. When the day of Pentecost had arrived, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like that of a violent rushing wind came from heaven and it filled the whole house where they were staying. They saw tongues like flames of fire that separated and rested on each one of them. Then they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in different tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now there were Jews staying in Jerusalem devout people from every nation under heaven. When the sound occurred, a crowd came together and was confused because each one heard them speaking in his own language. They were astounded and amazed, saying, Look, aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? How is it that each of us can hear them in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, those who live in Mesopotamia, in Judah and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pam Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the magnificent acts of God in our own tongues. They're all astounded and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? And then verse 13, but some sneered and said, they're drunk on new wine. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Actually, let's try that one more time. All right. What we're going to... We, sort of instituted this, but I've never just said it like that. But what we try and do is say, this is God's word or this is the word of the Lord at the end of a scripture reading. And we give thanks for that because in his holy scriptures, God has revealed himself to us. And it's in fact, the only place through human history that you can know God has spoken because of again and again, the witness that has been born to. When I speak, you're like, oh, geez, I hope God's speaking through Mike. But when you read the word of the Lord, God is speaking to you, amen? Let's try that. So let's try that end bit one more time. This is God's word. Thanks be, God. Thanks be to God. I love that. I love it. All right. You remember that old Snickers ad, you're not you when you're hungry? Yeah. Right? And, you know, there'd be some sort of situation and some famous person getting, getting really aggro about something and then they'd eat a Snickers and then they'd turn back into a normal human being, you know, even despite the fact that Snickers is like a third-rate chocolate bar at best. But that's fine. We can argue about that another day. I'm coming in hot today. I haven't had any practice. I'm just getting up here and doing it. I don't care. Fight me. So our uh, 2021, our elders had a big fast. And when we were having that fast, we were like, okay, 48 hours, water only. That's all we're going to do. We want to hear the word of God. And we're like, okay, we're committed together to doing this. And we, we were really excited for that. And we were focused. And the first 24 hours, we're sending messages back and forth on Slack going, God's been speaking to me. I'm, I'm loving this. I'm hearing the voice of God. By about hour 38, the conversation has shifted. And the conversation is more like, help me, Lord, I'm drowning. It's a day and a half with only water. Help me. I took a nap. I just took a nap in the middle of the day because it's a Monday and I can do things like that on a Monday. Most normal people can't. Sorry, I can go tomorrow and have a nap if I want to. It's good stuff. So again, sorry, I'm not winning friends this evening, am I? I don't go for Adelaide football teams either. I don't care. <laughs> This is what it would be like if I let Stefan come up here too. But only like, yeah, he'd be twice as harsh, wouldn't you? Anyway. 
when when uh, this happened, uh, we all had a nap and we we're weak at the knees and, and it was just the funniest thing. I, and I went and at the end of it, we all <laughs> gathered together for a shared meal and we all thought, yeah, we're going to eat like steak. And no, we just had vegetable broth because that's all we could manage after two days. And it was very, nu- you'd be surprised how nourishing vegetable broth is after two days of eating nothing. Uh, and I went shopping during this time, which is insane. And I went and bought uh, some packet ravioli thing that didn't like needed like nine other things, and I'd still needed to cook it. And it was the the dumbest impulse purchase ever because you're not you when you're hungry, right? That's the theory. You shouldn't go shopping when you're hungry. That's a bad time. You buy lots of snacks. Here's my theory: you are you when you're hungry. My theory is that hunger is in fact a great revealer of who we actually are. We revert to our truest selves when you take some of the things away that make us comfortable, right? Like if you take away all the things that make us very comfortable and in control in life, you just take away somebody's mobile phone and say, hey, I want you to get to this place on the other side of the city. They're like, what are you talking? Where is my map and direction? Like they'll panic, right? This is what happens. We are more ourselves when we're hungry, church. And for the context of the book of Acts, we want to be hungry. We want to be spiritually hungry because that's what's happening in the book of Acts. If we take food away, we get hungry, but we also get hangry. You take water away, we get thirsty, but we also get a bit desperate like because we know we need water to survive. And the way Google, all the stats showed us during COVID that when you take normal society away, we begin to get spiritually desperate. That is the situation they're in in the book of Acts. They were spiritually desperate. The disciples had just seen Jesus ascend into the heavens. And it was like, take Jesus away and let's see what the disciples do. Well, they get confused first, but then they do what God told them to do. They do what Jesus told them to do. That is, they gather together and pray. And they pray and they pray. And in their obedience, in one of those moments in obedience, the Holy Spirit falls on them like fire and the church was born. So church, my question to to you is who's hungry tonight? Who's hungry for the things of God in their life tonight? God, jeez, that's underwhelming. We are going to get there. Because church, it's the start of a new year. It is. February is like the real start, right? January, we're sort of just getting our way back into getting used to the idea of turning the page in the calendar or writing a three instead of a two. But this is the start of a new year in earnest. And what I want you to do is begin this new year filled with fire and faith for what God will do in your life, regardless of circumstance. Amen? Amen. Okay. What I want to talk about is revival. I am hungry for revival. I've, I've been a pastor for about 10 years or so. I've been a Christian for about 20. And my whole life, I've just wanted to see the continuous movement of God. That's what I want more than anything else. I want to see that happen in our time as it has in times past. You talk to people who were in Wales during the Welsh revival. You talk to people who were in Iona when it broke out over there in the Isle of Skye and the Hebrides in Scotland. There's been revivals that have broken out all through the place. Azusa Street in Los Angeles. If you think of the way revival broke out amongst indigenous communities throughout remote Australia in the mid 20th century, revival breaks out. We've got to ask ourselves sometimes why, where, how? How, how do we help that happen? Can we have anything to do with revival breaking out? We should want revival to happen. And revival, friends, is not random. It is not an accident. You can actually create room for revival to happen. Let me say that again. You can create room for revival to happen. This is what Mark Sayers said about it. Personal renewal precedes corporate revival. Personal renewal precedes corporate revival. We will not, friends, see true revival as a church and as a country unless we ourselves are willing to do the inner work to see ourselves renewed in order to see the Spirit of God work through us. Amen? We are asking our, of our, God is asking of ourselves something before he asks it of anyone else. And if, and if you're trying, if you're new to the Christian faith here, let me tell you, the Christian faith is not about us telling you what to do. It is about us listening to the voice of God about what to do in our own lives. And we hope and pray that what God does bears witness to his goodness and grace to you. But it's all about what God's doing in us. We are the ones going, talk to us, God. Help us, transform us, make us in your image. That's why Jesus says things like, take the log out of your own eye, not the speck out of someone else's. Focus on what you can do to be closer to Jesus. That's the vision. And when I say you need personal renewal and you need to listen to Jesus and all these things, this is what I mean. You need two things. You need openness and you need obedience. 
Openness and obedience. That's it. Really, really simple. Now, doing it's a bit harder, obviously. But just openness to the presence of God and obedience to the promptings of God. That's what's required. Revival, then, is just renewal gone viral. It's when renewal happens in enough hearts that it bursts out across an area. It's when people who are renewed begin to step out in faith and do the work of the Holy Spirit amongst one another and something starts to spark. It's like a bushfire of the Holy Spirit, which is why it's so appropriate that the Holy Spirit came as fire on the day of Pentecost. That's what happens. And you've all seen some form of this. Like the worst form of that is like a mob mentality. When one person gets angry, they're a lunatic. When three people get angry together and people are like, yeah, I don't mind that, that's when things get scary. You with me? You follow what I'm saying? We have all seen an idea go viral. We've all seen, whether good or bad, what we need more than anything else in our lives is the Holy Spirit to go viral. And it will only happen if we seek personal renewal. That's what happened at Pentecost. It was just the first time it had happened. That was the revival, right? Before the revival. Everything else is a revival. That was just, that was just revival. That what's happened. That's what happened when the Holy Spirit poured out at Pentecost. People gathered together, obeying the command of Jesus to wait and be open to the Spirit. The church was born at a prayer meeting. This is not an accident. It's a requirement. This is what it says in 2 Chronicles. Chapter 7, verses 14 to 15. When my people who bear my name humble themselves, pray and seek my face and turn from their evil ways, then I will hear from heaven. Then I will hear from heaven. Forgive their sin and heal their land. My eyes will now be open and my ears attentive to prayer from this place. Now, hear me. God is always attentive to your prayers. He is your loving father. But revival, that is the, the curation and care for the work of the Spirit throughout the land is precious. And in the wrong hands, it's pretty bad. And God is longing to see renewed hearts. Why? So he can entrust us with the powerful work of his Holy Spirit through us and in us to see a move of God in our nation today. But it starts with personal renewal. It starts with personal renewal. God is waiting to hear from his people. Am I saying we can force revival? No. No, I'm not saying that. What I am saying is that it's a cop-out when we say revival is just God's job. The transformation is God's job. The preparation is your job. Yeah, let me say that again. The transformation is God's job. The preparation is your job. You can't outsource personal renewal. You can't, sorry, I'm really sorry to say this bit. You can't just come to church on Sunday and go, I'm renewed because Mike's going to do it for me. I'm like, absolutely not. I mean, those of you who know me well enough, I I will long past that point. But if you're new here, that's not how it's going to work. Your relationship with, with God is not mediated by me. It's mediated by your relationship with Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And that's it. That's it. You don't need me to show you the way to God. You just need Jesus. So when I say openness and obedience, this is what I mean. You really just need passion and responsibility. You need to steward the fire of God in you that you're hungry for it. Steward a passion inside yourself. But then be responsible for what it takes to do that. Okay? So some people are very passionate people. I'm more naturally a passionate person than a responsible person. My wife's like all caps amen in the comments section at home right now. Which means that it's not hard for me to steward a passion for God particularly. It is hard for me to then go and put some disciplines in place around that. Passion is sticking your hands up in the air during worship. Woo! Personal responsibility is going home and quietly seeking the face of God in the corner of your room when no one is around to see you chuck your hands up. That's passion and responsibility working together. Let me give you a real-life representation that might be a bit more down-to-earth. A couple of years ago, I, li- I can't remember who did this, but somewhere at Encounter, uh, I remember we were about to throw away some of the temporary batteries that uh, we were we using the microphones. And uh, was that you, Alex? Do you know what I'm about to say? Classic. Great. I, I'd forgotten, but thank you for owning this. And uh, I was about to throw them away, and Alex, or whoever it was, said, no, don't do that. I was like, what? He's like, you can recycle one use batteries. I was like, oh, okay, great. She's like, let me give them here. So she started gathering up all the single use batteries and she put them in a single use coffee cup and then she left them at church. 
So passion is having a heart for recycling that says we need to care for our planet. Responsibility is then taking those batteries yourself <laughs> and actually recycling them and perhaps not using a single use cup that had never been used at the same time. That's how passion and responsibility. <laughs> Praise God. <laughs> Passion and responsibility, hand in hand. The same is true of your spirit. You must steward a passion because responsibility without passion is joyless. But passion without responsibility is shallow. You must steward passion so that you have joy. You must steward responsibility so you have depth. And my friends, if you want to see the world transformed in the image of Jesus, and I pray you do because that's not about you, it's about him, you should want desperately to have a joy and a depth to share with the world. That will sustain you. That will sustain the world out there. So, are you with me so far? Good. We can't cultivate revival, but we sure can curate space for, sorry, we can't create it, we can cultivate it. And we can stop it. We can stop revival. Now that sounds like I'm preaching against the Word of God, but no, let me use the Word of God to show you what I mean. 1 Thessalonians 5.19 reminds us, do not quench the Holy Spirit. Do not quench the Holy Spirit. You can get in the way of the work of the Holy Spirit. The Amplified version says this, do not quench or subdue or be unresponsive to the working and guidance of the Holy Spirit. But I like, and yes, Kristen, watch out for your heresy counter here. I like the Passion Translation. That's been the most controversial thing I've said all night. This is what the Passion Translation, so far. The Passion says this, never restrain or put out the fire of the Holy Spirit. There is a warning in that. Never restrain or put out the fire of the Holy Spirit. As as I read that, it makes me think of the way Jesus told his disciples so firmly, get out of the way when children are trying to come to me because the kingdom belongs to them. Never quench that fire. When we do that, we are trying our best to stand in the way of life. That's what we're doing when we quench the Spirit's work. Because we can get in the way of what God wants to do by being disobedient. So we mustn't do that. How do we do that? I think there are five ways, and I want to share them really quickly. Five warnings before I want to invite you to start stirring up the work of the Spirit in your life. And the reason we need to do this is there's a legacy and a destiny going on. There's a general rule of thumb in in preaching circles which says if you're preaching to an older congregation – Preach a legacy. What are you leaving behind? If you're preaching to a younger congregation, preach a destiny. What has God got for you? Let me tell you, when we're talking about revival, we're talking about both. God has a destiny for the generations to come. He has a destiny for you in this room. No matter how old you are, if you're not dead, God's not done. He is moving in you. He wants to use you in grace and in power because he is loving on your behalf. But at the same time, there is a legacy to be left for generations ahead because the Christian life is not about you. It's about him and the church that he is building, which is both for you, but for the generations to come. So when I'm talking about that, I'm not just talking about something for me, but for Charlie. I'm not talking about something that's just for Dean, but for Joshy. I'm not talking about something that's just for Kat, but also for Laura, and also for Holly. Generations to come. That's what we are doing when we build and steward the work of God in our life for the church. Five things we can do to quench the Holy Spirit from Acts chapter 2. If you're a note-taking type, you're the best kind of person. This is for you. Number one. Number one. Distraction. Distraction will quench the work of the Holy Spirit in your life because it is our job to be focused on the work of the Spirit. Everyone on their phone right now is like, I'm taking notes. I am taking notes. Now, I'm, I'm as much of a hypocrite as anyone else on this. I have this constant cycle of downloading dumb games, playing dumb games, getting addicted to dumb games, deleting dumb games, swearing I'll never do it again, and downloading them again. Uh, this, is, this is, some of you may be familiar with this cycle. It's ridiculous. I just just deleted another one this morning because I was feeling convicted. (laughs) But distraction is the enemy of attention. And attention 
is really God's economy for you. Because when we give all our attention to God, we are worshipping God. That's what focused attention is. It is worship. The author James K.A. Smith puts it this way. You are what you love. You are what you love because from your thought, your thoughts will lead to your actions, right? You may have heard it said before that what you do shows what you really want. What you do shows your deepest desires. And it's really indisputable. You can't go, no, 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 no. I'm, I'm constantly doing this, but I actually want the opposite. It's like, well, then do it. You, do you know what I mean? Like it's, we, we can argue with it all we want, but our own actions betray us. And if we focus our energies on God, that makes me sound like I'm a spiritualist healer. But if we focus our attention on God, we begin to realize that when we make Jesus the center of our life, he actually expands the rest of our lives. Now, this is what happened in Acts chapter 2. The Holy Spirit breaks out, a miracle occur, and crowds begin to gather. Now, crowds are awesome. This is what's happening right now. But in crowds, people hide. And in crowds, people just defer to other people's faith. And other people's attention. So people in crowds can stick their hands up in worship and then like just sit at the back and be like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I was talking to somebody yesterday and uh, I was like, where, where were you in the, in the crowd yesterday? And they were like, yeah, I was at the back so I could, you know, hang out and not get in trouble if I was talking to somebody. I was like, oh, great. Okay. Oh, it's nice. During Josh's wedding speeches. Oh, nice. I was at the front, wasn't I? Getting picked on by your dad <laughs> for minutes at a time. It was great. It actually was great. But this is what we do in crowds. We like to hide so that we can get away with the things that we want to do. And we do that because we think in that moment that's what we want. But our most immediate desires are not our deepest desires. Let me say that again. Your most immediate desires, that is, I crave this, I want this, I need this right now, that is not your deepest desire. Distraction is the enemy of worship. And the enemy of worship is the enemy of revival. What does every technology company want? If you say your money, you're wrong. That comes second. They want your attention. They want your time. The attention and time you give them will ultimately translate into money somewhere down the line. So where you put your attention shows the focus of your heart. The more you get distracted, the less you can focus on God. John Tyson puts it this way. We need a generation who chooses to be deep in an era of distraction. And yes, if you're doing mic preaching bingo, you're doing pretty well so far. Sayers and Tyson. What you give your attention to ultimately reveals who you want to be. So if you want to see revival, you need to challenge the distraction of your soul. Here's the second thing that happens in crowds. In crowds, we just borrow someone else's faith for a while, okay? So I mentioned that briefly earlier. If you're here and the Christian faith is new to you, I'm so happy you're here. I love it. This is what it says in Acts. It, sa it says, in verse 12, the crowd was astounded and perplexed, and they started asking questions, saying, what does this mean? Uh, and and I, they are my favorite sort of people. If you are here and you're a spiritual seeker, and you're like, I don't really know what's going on in the Christian faith, but I'd, I'd like to ask some questions. Like, bring it on. Genuine questions. That is the best sort of thing. But often, people just kind of want to hide in the crowd. And, and they want to borrow someone else's because at some point you will have to decide whether or not you believe in it. Like one of the people I think asks the best spiritual questions in the world is a man by the name of Jeremy Wilkes. Handsome, handsome man sitting roughly over there by the name of Jeremy Wilkes. He asks the best questions. And when he was an intern, again and again, we'd be like, wow, where's this question coming from? But it was also apparent, and, and Wilkes would tell you the same thing. He was still working out where his faith was as an intern. And at some point, he had to go, these are good questions, but good questions aren't enough. I need to plant my flag somewhere. These questions need to lead me down a path where I either say, Jesus is the true son of God, or he is not. It is either true or it's not. Now, we live in an era where we want to pretend there's like nine different ways, and they're all roughly the same. We only say that because we don't bother to explore the ways. When we explore the ways, it's like, ah, oh, Buddhism, Christianity, it's all kind of the same. It's like they're, they're kind of the opposite of each other, in fact. I, I appreciate what you're saying that they're both classified as religions, but that's kind of like going into a library and seeing a true crime book and a piece of fiction and going, they're the same. It's like, they're not, though, are they? Like, they're not. And this is what we do when we don't have enough depth. We lacked it. We, first we get distracted, and then we get consumerist, and we become what I would call a moral therapeutic deist. I'm not going to go too far down that line. 
except to say this, a moral therapeutic deist is somebody who believes in a God who only gives you good advice and makes you feel good. As soon as that God does not make you feel good, you decide they're not your God. But church, let me tell you something. If you only believe in a God that makes you feel good and tells you what you want to hear, you do not believe in God. You just believe in you. You're just listening to an echo chamber of yourself. Only the true God can tell you things you do not want to hear. Only the true God can rattle your worldview, but lead you deeper to himself. If you only ever listen and agree with the, th- the people in your echo chamber, do you know what you get? You get the sort of culture we have in 2023. That's what happens. And it comes from an era of consumerism where we say, I only want what makes me feel good. Church, that is a shallow faith. It will not get you where you need to go. If you want to see a destiny of revival in your life, you're going to have to go deeper. You're going to have to worship a God who occasionally says to you, you're wrong. Who occasionally says to you, what you are doing is a sin and it is hurting you and the people around you. If you can't worship a God like that, you cannot worship Jesus, which means you can't worship God at all. Hard, isn't it? I told you I was going to say more offensive things. But that's why they talk about Jesus being a stumbling block. He is when we come before Jesus and realize that we actually need him not only to save us, but to convict us. That's painful. That's painful. Let me get to number three. Number three is cynicism. If you want to quench the Holy Spirit in your life, be more cynical. There is nothing educated about cynicism. Let me correct that mistake for you. I went to a private school and a university, so let me do that. There's nothing smart about being a cynic. It's just sapping joy out of life. Cynics are not realists. Realists are people that need to see things as they clearly are and examine facts before coming to a conclusion. Cynics are people who make, make a mockery of every possible fact and come to no conclusion at all except to sneer at everybody. This is what it says. In the scriptures, some sneered, verse 13, and said, they're drunk on new wine. Now, this was a common accusation amongst the disciples, against the disciples, because they'd taken up the practice of communion, drinking wine together, and they were known for going to parties with sinners and people that had a bad reputation. Basically, the disciples were just the best hang. They were the nicest people when they went to the best parties. And so people would accuse them of being drunks, but they didn't really care. What they wanted to do was undermine the reality of Jesus. The undermine the reality and effect of what God was doing in the disciples' lives. Now, find me a more expert nation of cynics than Australians. Maybe the Scandinavians, but I never know what they're saying because I don't speak a Scandinavian language. Australians, disbe- uh, we're laughing. Yeah, yeah I mean, I don't, I don't know where to go with that. Let me just roll on. We, we, come to me later and teach me Swedish. We disbelieve anything in Australia that we can't see with our own eyes or touch with our own hands, right? And many things that we do. At Pentecost, there's a visible miracle, yet people sneer. Now, here's what happens. Cynics come up with excuses, right? Realists examine it and then go, hmm, okay, what happens if I have to do this? And they actually think through it. But cynics come up with excuses. Ah, the disciples are drunk. Ah, can't be real. Science will explain it away. What science? Are you going to ask like a follow-up question? No, 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 just science. Okay. Uh, It's the patriarchy's fault. Oh, what specifically do you mean by that? Don't make me ask. That's an aggressive question. Okay, whatever. It's a social construct. Okay. We can go on and on and on about the excuses we use to justify our own behavior and to run away from the Lord. But at the end of the day, cynicism points fingers at everyone else without asking questions of themselves. Cynics bring down. They don't build up. I get I get how much hurt institutions like the church have caused people over the year, over the years, hopefully not the year, (laughs) but over the years. But if you're only deconstructing without building something in your life, you're going to be deconstructed. You're going to be the one left to hurt. God is building something in you if you let him. So if you want to see a legacy of revival, don't let cynicism rule in your hearts. One final thing on cynicism. God is... God isn't restricted by your cynicism. He's much more powerful than that, but he's not going to bless it either. He's not restricted by it, but he's not going to bless it. 
If you want to see a legacy of revival, trust to the promises of God, trust to the proof we see of him in the Bible, trust to the proof you've seen in your own lives, the testimonies of what you've heard from people around you, and walk in that. Number four, this is important, this applies to every one of you without exception, fear. Fear. It's the one that grips us the tightest. It's a symptom of a need for control, right? We fear what we can't control or what we don't understand. And revival is both of those things. We can't control it. We don't understand it, even if we want it. Now, you get to control how you respond to God. That is up to you. It's up to you whether you say yes or no. What you can't control is how others view you for responding to God in that way. So let me say that again. You control your response to God, right? Right? You have free will. That is the gift of God that we all wrestle with. You control that part. What you don't control is how others look of you. There will be people in your lives. You start following Jesus. And there are people that position themselves that say, I am so inclusive and tolerant. And then you say, I started following Jesus. And they just scream bigot at you. It's like, oh, sorry, who's being intolerant here? I just, I'm, I'm just telling you what's going on in my life. I'm not trying to impose it on yours. There'll be other people who have been hurt, and you've got to be very gentle with those people. But often, it's just people reading headlines. And you've got to ask yourselves, if the cost of following Jesus is people don't like that, will I still follow Jesus? Let me say it another way. If the cost of following what I know is to be true is to stand up against people who claim it is untrue, do I want the truth or do I want personal acceptance in my social circles? That's big, and it's hard. Let me put it to you, though, a different way. The God who has done something miraculous in you, who has reached down into the depths and saved you from the depths of destruction, is that more important than the dude you went to high school with getting mad in your Instagram comments? Like, honestly, because that tends to be how it happens. We're like, oh, I put up an Instagram story saying I love Jesus, and somebody said they didn't. It's like, okay, don't worry about them. Just brush it off, man. But like that's what Jesus said to his disciples. His disciples got sent out two by two. And he said, hey, some places you go to, they're not going to let you in the doors. They're not going to let you hang out with them. Just brush the dust off your feet and keep going. Don't stress about it. And do you know what else he said that's so important? And the spirit of peace will return to you. The Holy Spirit will return to you. Your depth, your intimacy with the Holy Spirit cannot be stopped by other people around you unless you let them. It's all on you, all on you. There are times when we're, we're begging and crying out to God for more of His grace, more of His mercy, but the attention of other people, the opinions of other people, that's all up to you. You choose how you respond to that. I choose how I respond to that. We've got to ask ourselves, do we want the Spirit of God, the destiny of revival, the legacy of hope breaking out in the world around us, or do we want the approval of those around us regardless of what we truly believe? And that is hard if you're a people pleaser, but you will learn such an important lesson that above all else, we need to choose to follow Jesus. Imagine if the disciples had bowed to the people sneering at them. Here is point number five, the final point. The key to all of this can be seen in the last few verses of Acts chapter two. Now, Peter finishes his message. The band comes back up, I assume. The band comes back up. Uh, there, there, he, there we go. He's on him. We're a work in progress. And <laughs> I'm getting the Jeremy Glower behind me. I can feel it. The force is strong with this one. Peter finishes his message. And the crowd who have gathered around is cut to the heart. I love that phrase. The Holy Spirit is speaking to them in a way that it's it's like they're physically struck, physically hit. And they ask Peter, what do we do? It's that genuine, beautiful spiritual question where they go, it's not that I'm against God. I I just don't know what to do. I'm new at this. I love that. Love that. Peter says, this is what you need to do. Repent and be baptized. Oh, what does he mean by that? Well, repentance is when we just turn away from our sins. I think sometimes people think it's like getting into this wrestling match with our sins until we like pin them down to the ground. That doesn't work. It does not work. It's like wrestling a, a pig in mud. You and the pig both get dirty and only the pig enjoys it. You know, 
doesn't work. What you really need to do in repentance, this is what the word means. The Greek word means to turn and face the other way. Right? So you're going this way towards sin. And sin is not like, oh, you bad person. Sin is everything that is against the will and wisdom of God for your life. God's will and wisdom aren't just for the sake of it. It's because he loves you. That's what it is. And sin is like saying, I want to choose what helps hurt me over what helps bless me. So we walk towards sin and God says, repent. And so we turn away and instead we turn towards Jesus because Jesus is full of truth and grace. When we follow Jesus, we walk in light and hope and ultimately renewal that leads to revival. And we just turn our back on that stuff. We change the focus of our attention. We're not distracted by that anymore. We change the focus of our attention. We turn our back on our sins and follow Jesus. So what's the baptism thing about? Well, the baptism is like stepping into Jesus' death and resurrection. See, for those who are new to the story, spoilers, this is how it ends. Jesus lives a perfect, sinless life on our behalf. He teaches and performs miracles in order to perform proofs that He is the Christ, the Saviour, the Messiah. And they string Him up to die on a cross. And He takes the curse of sin on each one of us. The thing is, death is ultimately, God says, the wages that we have for our sin, the ways we turn away for God. And Jesus takes all that on Himself, but because He never sins, death cannot hold Him down. Three days later, He's resurrected from the grave. And that paves the way for us when we put our faith in who Jesus was, in His works, His life, His birth, His death, His resurrection, for us to have that relationship with God too. All the things, all these sins I talked about that get in the way of that relationship with God, it's not about fixing each one of them. Jesus has done that work. We just fix our eyes on Him. So we get baptised because going into the water and coming back up is like stepping into His death and resurrection. It's like being washed clean of an old life and born again into a new one. And I would echo what Jasmine said. If you haven't got baptised but you believe in Jesus, let's flip and go. Let's get you dunked soon. So the, the crowd, Peter says, Repent and be baptised, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. Because the biggest thing that quenches the Holy Spirit's work in your life is unrepentant sin. And this is, this is what it looks like. You already know Jesus. He's been speak, trying to speak to you about what you're doing in your life. And you're saying, best case scenario, you're saying, what if I just have a bit of each and hold them together? Because that's kind of what our culture tells us we can do. We just have a bit of a, like a candy shop selection, mixed bag, and just hold it all together. And God says, that's not really how it works, because I'm a holy God. I'm perfect in my love and grace, perfect in my identity. And if you try and add something to that, once you add unholiness to holiness, it's just unholiness. It doesn't work. And so friends... If you can't repent in your hearts, just as I come to a close here, you can't follow Jesus. That sounds hard, but it's as simple as turning, turning away. And it begins by saying, that's what I want. Remember, it's about our attention. That's what I want. Jesus, I don't even know how to do that. I've got more problems than you could possibly imagine. And some of you are sitting here going, wait, everything? Yeah, 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 but just just turn. Don't try and fight them all. Don't try and get in the mud with your sin. Just turn and follow Jesus. He's led the way. He's lived a perfect life, so you don't have to. We live out of love for Jesus. We live out of His grace, out of His goodness. Friends, there's nothing more important in your life than following Jesus. And if you've got this stuff, this sin in your life that you know is getting in the way of you and God, if you've been sitting here during worship or as I've been talking and, and you know God's been prompting you saying, it's this, it's this, it's this. You've never spoken to anyone. You've never been honest about it. You've never confessed it. You need to put that behind you. And the first way we do that is we confess it to somebody. We confess our sins to each other. So I want to encourage you to take a minute here. I'm going to pray for a second and then we'll, and then we'll close this up. 
just take a moment and allow God to speak to you through His Holy Spirit. I can talk as loud and fancy and occasionally obnoxiously as I, as I want to, but what you, what you need is, is not my words, but the conviction of the Holy Spirit in your heart. Oh God, we just come before you now. It's the start of a new year. For some of us, that's so exciting. For others, it's like, I'm just, I'm just stuck in the same rut, Lord. And maybe you're here and you're wrestling with the, the kind of big obvious sins. It's addiction, it's, it's porn and sex, it's, it's terrible relationships, it's drugs, it's alcohol. Maybe it's that you cause pain to other people and you've never repented of that. You've never said sorry, you've never invited forgiveness. I just want to invite you, turn from that, follow Jesus. Maybe the sins you're holding on to are a little more abstract. Things like pride. You're convinced that you know better than God. I want to encourage you, let go of that and follow Jesus. Selfishness. Taking your time for yourself. Instead of asking God, how do you want my time to be spent? Let it go. Follow Jesus. Anger. Having hatred towards your brother, your sister. No matter who they are. Lord says, lay that down. Let me fill your heart with love. Follow me. And I, you know, I really feel there's something in that for someone here today. Maybe more than one person that you've got a real anger towards another person in your heart. You view them as an enemy. You probably wouldn't use that word, but you hate them. Or you've tried to cut them off. Never speak to them again. But the hands of Jesus are healing hands. They're hands of grace and mercy. And in the prayer that God gave us to pray, that Jesus gave us to pray, the Lord's Prayer, He said, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. You need to forgive that person. Whatever their hurt was, real or imagined, let it go in Jesus' name. And if you've hurt someone else, you've got to repent of that. You've got to own it. Confess your sin to someone else. Not necessarily to that person. That might not be appropriate. But you need to confess your sin to somebody. And let it go. The glory of the revival of God is it doesn't have to come with a noisy fire. It can come in a whisper. comes as we renew our hearts. Come, Lord Jesus. Now, I said before, I'm much more passionate and responsibility. If it was up for me, I'd be getting pretty fired up now. But I, I think the Lord wants to do something in the stillness. Because revival isn't about getting fired up one day and then letting it go the next day. It's about renewing our hearts in God. It's like it's like we trust our hearts to God. We trust our hearts to God. And then we just say, God, would you would you speak to me about what you want me to do? That's the heart of a follower of Jesus. We trust Jesus. We say, you know what? I believe that you are my God and King. You're my Saviour. Do I know what every one of those words means and how it plays out? Probably not. And I am going to work that out because that's important. But I trust you and I want to obey you. Where do you need to obey the Lord tonight? We're going to sing a song now called Available. It's a beautiful, beautiful song. And it's a song that will will speak to the hearts of of, of people that need to listen to what God's saying. I want to encourage you, just respond to that. Where do you need to be available to what God is convicting you of tonight? Let's worship together. I want to invite you to stand.